Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our latest installment of our Lunch and Learn sessions. And today's a very uh, seasonal topic to some extent because we're into the good weather. Uh, it's nice outside. Uh, a lot of people like to get away, get to cottage country. Um, it's it's really quite a pastime for people living in in southern Ontario to um, to look to acquire a cottage or rural property, and uh, in in addition to their property in the in the heart of the GTA, and we have so many lakes, so many rivers. Uh, it's a unique a uniqueness to our to our area in southern Ontario. So we always have a, a lot of these type of inquiries and these types of transactions. And we thought it'd be a good topic for you is, is, and it's one of these topics that you're going to look at it like many others from two points of view. One is, you know, whether you're acting as an agent, helping someone buy or sell a cottage or rural property. And the other, some of you for your own uh, personal use are looking to acquire cottage properties and, um, and are involved in that. And a lot of people have uh, cottage properties that have been in families for a long period of time and and that creates a whole bunch of succession issues and other issues and we deal with that type of stuff all the time they're very tricky issues cottages for some reason are extremely emotional for most people that have, have a history with them uh, my family's no exception uh, my, my in-laws have had a cottage um, that i've been freeloading at for over 40 years already uh, since i was a teenager and um and love it and my kids all grew up there and my with their with their cousins and and their aunts and uncles and and then figuring out what to do for the next generation is a challenge for everybody but anyways if any of you are um, lucky enough to either be acting for clients that are looking to acquire a cottage or rural property or you're thinking of doing it yourself i think you'll find some of the things that we're going to discuss today um pretty interesting so I want to get into it. Um, so uh, the usual first few slides are come up with all our contact information. Please reach out anytime uh, to contact me with any questions on this topic or, or any other topic. Um, our areas of practice, although we're, a, we're quite a, a boutique, I describe our firm as a real estate boutique. We do a fair bit of corporate commercial work in terms of buying and selling small businesses, incorporating companies and things like that. And we do uh, wills and powers of attorney for our clients. And, um, and uh, you know, so that's an important part of practice too. And that comes into cottage and succession planning and things as well. Things get a little bit tricky on that side. And, and we have a lawyer that does some family law as well. So just keep us in mind for all of those things. And uh, we hope to be able to help you out with all those things. And uh, we've got three different offices. We're near all of your offices somewhere between our actual full-time offices in Mississauga, Markham, and Toronto, but we're, we're everywhere that the internet is, obviously. We can close a transaction anywhere in Ontario. And I can tell you, you know, from that point of view, that we're quite active in cottage country. We actually have an office right now in Gravenhurst. It's not on this slide as well. But in, in Gravenhurst, up in the, uh, you know, the gateway to the Muskokas, right at the main intersection in the town of Gravenhurst, uh, we have a satellite office that uh, we've been using up there. And we have a, quite a big presence in, in that area as well. We've got some, uh, some signs up there. I'm up in that, in that part of the country quite a bit, as is my partner. And we have a clerk that's uh, spending a couple of days a week in one of the offices there. She lives in Aurelia, but she's spends a couple of times in an office in Gravenhurst. So we do a lot of cottage transactions in that area and all over the, the, uh, the province for that matter, because it really doesn't matter where we are and we can close a transaction anywhere in the province of Ontario. And with the improvements that we've made uh, to some extent created by, um, by COVID and the inability to meet clients in person, we have a fabulous electronic signing system in place now <laughs> where we do video conferences with clients. We, we, we send them one link, they click on it, that connects them to our video conference. It gives them all the documents. They can sign electronically as we go through the documents. It's all recorded. We finish the meeting, we push a button 
and everybody gets copies of the signed documents and we're ready to close. So we've, so it really doesn't matter anymore where you are in the province of Ontario, we can close the transaction for you. So just keep that in mind. And uh, please tune into um, to our podcast. I've got a, a weekly podcast. We just recorded episode 48 yesterday, David and David on real estate. Uh, we have different guests that come on. Um, most of it is agent centric. Like it's really geared to real estate agents. Tune in some tips, uh, different people that we have come on about how to improve your practice and uh, things that are going on in the market, things that you might benefit in. So you can access it anywhere. You can, you can listen to it uh, as a podcast. You can watch it on YouTube. Uh, the table of contents basically is available for all of them. So you can tune in and pick and choose what you want to listen to. So I encourage you to, to tune into that as well. Follow us and all the other social media. Anyways, you'll get all this, but let's get into the, the topic at hand. And and dealing with cottage and rural properties is quite different than dealing with a typical residential property that many of you might be used to. And there's a whole bunch of things that we look at it. And some of this up here is just to give you information as to what we're doing, because part of it is, is what's our role as a lawyer, as opposed to your role as an agent. But as you know, we're, we're a team, we're looking for the same thing. And sometimes we don't get started as a lawyer until you've already been negotiating the agreement of purchase and sale. So you as a buyer's lawyer in particular have to know what type of issues to be looking out for that you wouldn't have ever put your mind, your mind to if you were dealing with a, a more typical residential or urban type of property that you're looking at. So, you know, one of the key things we're, we're looking at and some of it, you know, we have to do our title searches obviously to, to verify and figure these things out. Is the property a whole of a lot? Is the property a part of the lot? We have to check adjoining lands to see if there's any Planning Act violations. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with what the Planning Act is, but it basically is the, the act in Ontario that prevents people from just um, reconfiguring their lands. So, for example, if I bought a, a, a parcel of land and then I bought the neighboring parcel right beside it, and it's both in my name, those parcels would generally merge under the Planning Act and become when one big parcel. So if I wanted to then sell them off as the two lots that I originally, or two parcels that I really created, I can't do that because I merged them. So sometimes there's Planning Act issues and a lot of times that happens in these cottage type of settings where someone may have a cottage, the neighbor's cottage might become available, they acquire that property as well. And maybe a generation goes by or a number of years go by, they're using both properties. And then maybe they decide to sell one. And now they can't uh, sell one because they, the properties have merged. So sometimes we have issues that way. They become one property. So you have to get a severance in order to deal with it. Uh, what we're always finding interesting when we look at cottage properties is the access to it. If you're buying a property in the middle of Toronto, you know where the roads are, you know, where the, it's pretty obvious where the roads are and how you're getting to the property. It's not the same in cottage country. So we have to check to see what access is there, vehicle access to the property. Is there a municipal road? Sometimes the road ends at a certain place and then there might be another road when you're physically there, but that might end up being a, a private road or a private road that maybe they have a right of way to go across it, maybe they don't. It might be owned by one of the cottages, and um, but they've granted a right of way to five or six or 10 other cottages to go through there to, you know, to follow the shoreline to access um, their cottage. But we have to look at it to see exactly what type of access do they have and do they have a legal access to it or is it access that's just been used over time and has never been documented properly on title. So we, you run into those type of questions all the time. So access is a, is a big issue. Now, um, we're looking to see uh, if the access is coming through the adjoining land. So, you know, was there an easement or a right of way registered on title that grants the potential buyer the right to go on that property to access it and lead them out to the municipal road? Or does that not exist? And if it doesn't exist, that's something that we've got to clean up um, before the new buyer acquires a title. So 
so whether it exists or not is one issue. Another issue is, okay, if, if there is a right to go on this private road, who's responsible for maintaining that road? It's owned by, it might be owned by one of the cottage owners, but they've granted access to other cottage owners to go across it, but are they all sharing in the cost of maintaining it? If it's not a public road, if it's a, then somebody has to be maintaining it. Somebody has to be fixing it and fixing the potholes and making sure it's all level and, and somebody has to be, uh, you know, repaving it if necessary, or it might be a dirt road, but it still might require some grading. And then in the winter months in particular, somebody has got to be snow plowing to, to give people access. So is that the responsibility of the owner of the private road, or is that a shared um, responsibility amongst the people that have been granted access over that? So, uh, we want to find out about that. Sometimes uh, there's some verbal agreements or just something on a hand, you know, by a handshake or a napkin that deals with these things. And other times there's actually agreements that have been drafted and signed by the parties and, and sometimes registered agreements on title. Sometimes they're not registered agreements, but they exist. And are those agreements binding on subsequent purchasers of these properties? And what process do we have to go through there? So the access issue itself does create a whole bunch of issues that we have to uh, look at. Um, another issue that, that we have to check out all the time is um, whether there's any municipal bylaws that might be registered on title or that might exist that puts any limitations on the type of structures that can be built on the property. So as you're, you're probably aware, you know, there's missile bylaws in, in, the, in the heart of an urban city as well that restrict um, use and what you can build on it and where you can build on it and what the setback requirements are, like how far away from a road, how far away from a neighbor's, uh, from the neighboring lot line does something have to be built? How far away from the shoreline does something have to be built? So we have to be looking at all of those things as well. Sometimes these bylaws restrict the use of a property in terms of season and certain things can be done only in certain seasons. So you find some very peculiar and interesting things when we look into these bylaws. So you got to be keeping this in mind all the time because as an agent, you know, you're looking to help acquire a property for a client. And even like way before you get into drafting an agreement of purchase and sale, you got to be making some of these inquiries to find out what the story is. Otherwise you won't know what to put in your agreement of purchase and sale. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so we, we want to see, you know, it's part of the access issue. Again, does the property, uh, there's a typo in here. It says, does the property directly about, that should be about, um, meaning uh, A-B-U-T. Is it next to, is it adjacent to a national or provincial highway? Okay, because if it's a national provincial highway, those are, are maintained, et cetera. Um, is there um, a permit that allows entry to, these, uh, to the access point? Is it necessary or is it not necessary? Um, is, if there is a permit, can you transfer the permit from owner to owner? We've seen situations where something was granted, a permit was granted to one party, but there's nothing in the document that says when they sell the property, they, those rights that they have are assignable or transferable to the next owner. So that means you got to go back to the party that granted the permit and negotiate and get something for, uh, you know, for the new owner. So we run into these weird type of issues all the time. So one of the things we're doing when we're dealing with cottage and rural properties, there's certain off title searches that we have to look into. And some of these we're not doing when we're closing standard residential transactions. Uh, for example, building and zoning, we, we want to send a letter to the municipality uh, a lot of times to find out if the property is zoned for its current use or the intended future use uh, of the property. Now, in most residential, urban residential transactions, we don't send any letters to the building or zoning department anymore if we are using title insurance as part of the process for closing. So, uh, we make certain assumptions on those transactions. We get a title insurance policy. We don't directly make those inquiries to see um, what the zoning is. But 
when we're dealing with a rural or cottage property, sometimes we, we it, it makes sense to still make those inquiries. And we are making those inquiries. We're sending money to the municipality or the town for answers on this. And it's usually a hundred dollars or more to do it. So there's costs involved, but sometimes we need to have that information. There's certain things that title insurance uh, will not cover on, on urban or sorry, on cottage or rural properties uh, because of all these various quirks and issues that come up. Uh, one of the big issues that you have to check out, you, we, same thing that we all have to know about when dealing with a cottage property is the source of water. Uh, you know, where is the water coming from? Is it coming from a well, as it often is on cottage properties? Or is the property close enough to a town municipality but there's actually connections to the public water uh, coming in? Uh, sometimes these that get converted over time where the property might've been used for a number of years because it was so isolated that it was, it was well water. And, uh, and now, you know, the municipality, the municipality has grown and grown and now water is available and there might be an opportunity to connect into municipal water. Same thing for sewage, um, you know, that issue. So it's an important issue to figure out what's, what's the water source. Is there a well? Is it public water? The third option in some properties is the water is just being pumped up from the lake. So if it's being pumped up from a, wa from a well or it's being pumped up from the lake, is it going through a filtration system? Is the water drinkable? The, the term for drinkable water is actually potable. Is the water potable? So that's a really important issue to determine whether or not the existing water situation on the property that might be acquired is potable. Is it drinkable? Is it healthy for human consumption? So there are tests that can be done. Um, usually we're putting, we want a condition to be put in there or um, that it'll be conditional upon the buyer satisfying themselves that the water is potable, or there might be a representation and a warranty from the seller confirming that it is potable and they might have evidence to, to prove that. So we, but one way or the other, we want the issue addressed in an agreement of purchase and sale because we have to know that people are going to be drinking healthy water uh, from that. Uh, sometimes well water is being shared with adjoining properties. So we have to determine if there's an agreement between the properties to maintain it to if maybe there's a filtration system. Uh, maybe there's limits on how much can be drawn up uh, from it. Uh, so we want to find out, is there an agreement? And again, if there is an agreement, can the agreement be transferred or signed to subsequent owners or, or do they have to? Is there a cost involved? We want to check all of that out. So similar issue comes up with the sewage system. You know, how is the sewage being dealt with at the particular property? Is it all going into a septic tank on the property? Is there a proper, does the, if there is, then there's probably a, some sort of sump pump system, some sort of system that has to take it from the, the toilets in the cottage and the sinks, et cetera, and make sure it gets into the, into the septic tank. So there's, sometimes there's a series of pumps that do that. We want to know that they're all in good working order and they're all functioning and that the septic tank is in good condition and that it gets cleaned out regularly. They all have a limited capacity and every once in a while they have to be uh, cleaned out and, and emptied so what's we want evidence to see when the last time that happened maybe it's been done recently and it won't have to be done for five years or ten years on the property depending on the type of of, um, of consumption or usage of the property and how many people are there and how often it's like some you know it's all not all septic tanks are not created equally they have different capacities and they have different life expectancies. So we want to know the status and the state of that. So again, we're going to need representations and warranties from the vendor in the agreement of purchase and sales with respect to the state of those, when they were inspected last, when they were cleaned out last, things like that. Okay, so your offer is either going to be conditional upon you satisfying yourself as the buyer and getting independent information, or you're going to be relying on reps and warranties from the vendor and you don't want just a verb, a written rep and warranty. You'd like to see the actual materials and and the um, the evidence that it's been cleaned out or it's been maintained or or what there is from a um, 
from a, a proper company that does these things. Okay. Other type of off title searches that we, we get into for these type of properties is the conservation authority type of things. You know, we're dealing with properties that are in, you know, on, on lakes, on rivers, uh, there are nature areas usually adjacent to them. There's uh, parklands generally owned by, uh, by the municipality, by the province, by the federal government. Um, a lot of times there's conservation authority lands adjacent to this. And because of that, we want, there are oftentimes some restrictions on what can be built if it's adjacent to some of those type of areas. So we want to find out what the story is from a conservation land point of view as well. So a lot of these properties are waterfront properties of some sort. It might be waterfront on a lake. It might be waterfront on a, on a river. Um, so we want to find that out. Sometimes cottage properties are not have no direct access. They're not built right onto the waterfront and they're set back a little bit and the access to the waterfront isn't direct. It may not even be owned. Sometimes it's through another property. So the same type of issues that we had with access to the property for vehicular traffic from roads, whether they're um, public roads or private roads, we have issues on the other end of the property that we have to look at to see exactly what access do we have to the water? And are there any limitations on access to the water? Can we use it year round? Um, is it can be used in, in the winter months? So generally the waterfront itself, the lakes and the rivers itself, the water itself is not privately owned. It's owned by the crown, that's the crown land, anybody, has the right to travel on Lake Muskoka, for example. You can launch a boat in Lake Muskoka and travel in Lake Muskoka. Uh, you can pull up right to cottage front properties on Lake Muskoka. You're not allowed to park at their docks because the docks are privately owned, but you're technically allowed to put an anchor down and, and swim in the lake right in front of somebody's cottage because they don't own the water that's in front of their properties. If they're putting a dock in the water or a boathouse, they had to get permits uh, for that, which is something else that we're gonna be checking out. But the, the um, water itself is generally crown land. Oftentimes the area that's really part of the shore is crown lands as well, because with water properties, whether it's a lake or, or, or a large river, the, the the bed of the width of the water always changes. You know, the tides go in, the tides go out. So it's very hard to determine exactly where the cottage property starts. Uh, you know, some of that could sometime part of the year be underwater and sometimes it's above water. But a lot of times on these properties, the area around the lake, right at the shore is actually a shore road allowance that's owned by the Crown. And, but you know, they're granting um, a permission for the cottage owners to cross that they're not restricting that but it's something we have to check out as well so when there are docks um, that are out there and, and boat houses as well you know these things are supposed to be built with valid permits issued by either the municipality sometimes it's the province sometimes it's the federal government depending on whose lands are involved, but they're supposed to be valid permits issued. And just like any other type of permit, they're supposed to be constructed based on, on building code and, and they have to be built properly in accordance with permits. Uh, when we're doing cottage property, we find structures like that all the time that have not been built with uh, permits. So it's an important issue because if a dock was built without a permit at any point in time, the government could come and say, you know, you got to remove that dock. Uh, it's not proper, wasn't built properly, and maybe go up, go apply after the fact for a permit. They might not grant the permit for the size of the dock and the configuration that you had. You can't just build whatever you want and put a dock out a mile long into the middle of the lake. Uh, these things are all restricted. So 
we're hoping to find out that there has been a valid permit and it was complied with. And there's no outstanding work orders against it and the dock was built properly, or it might even be a boathouse that was, uh, that was built. And we want to know that that's built uh, properly because you don't want to acquire something and take that risk that it wasn't. And then you find out after the fact that the government's requiring you to tear it down or to reconfigure it. So that's a, a major issue on these properties as well. Sorry, David, can I ask a question quickly sure. about your road allowances? Sure. Uh, I sold a property last year, um, a cottage property, waterfront property uh, that had a um, shore road allowance. The property, the seller had purchased it and he had told me that many years ago he had purchased it and he owned it. Um, I tried to verify it on geo warehouse. I couldn't verify it, but he swore up and down. He did. And then, um, the, the buyer agent who was, uh, he, he was from up that way, Minden Halliburton area. And, and he looked it up and he's like, yeah, yeah, it's right there. Could you give a little bit of direction about where we can find that if they've purchased the shore road allowance? Yeah, that that's some, sometimes very hard to figure out, um, and really it's part of the answer is just the historical nature of the way our registry office and systems have worked because, you know, originally for those of you that have been around for a long time, we had a registry system. We had a registry office, the registry system is what it was called. <clears throat> and you would search title and you basically, they always had to maintain a 40 year history and you search, you go back 40 years and everything was registered there. And then gradually in Ontario, we converted to the land titles system for the registry office and properties and the legal descriptions and the documents were converted into the land title system, which is a better system, a cleaner system, easier to use. There's all, a lot of advantages, et cetera. But when the conversions happen from the registry, to the land titles, there are certain searches that are done. The ministry verifies everything's good on title at this point in time that we're converting it. And now it goes into land titles and, you, and now when you do a search, you only see the type, the documents from that point in time when it was converted going forward. So oftentimes these shore road allowances and some of these interesting and peculiar access uh, grants and things like that were all done way before the conversion happened and they don't show up when you do a search because you're only seeing what hap what's happened going forward. You're seeing this brand new clean title and land titles. And um, so, you know, what you have, we have to do sometimes is go behind the land titles search to go back into the old registry documents and, and look for things there. And it's not an easy thing. It's not something that a lot of people can do. We actually have, you know, like we use uh, conveyancers, uh, you know, one guy in particular that we've been using at our firm, when we get into these situations, we get him on it and he's really good about digging and getting it behind it. It's harder to, to do those type of searches now too, because you can't just show up to a registry office anymore and just pull these the information yourself. They don't, registry offices don't exist like they once did. So it's a, it's a harder process to do. But anyways, it's sort of a long-winded answer to say, there is a way to do it. It's not so easy. Okay, because he had indicated- you just he... pull up Geo Warehouse, it's not going to show up there. And sometimes you just got to dig behind that. All right. He, that was what he told me. He was like, yeah, it's on geo warehouse. And I scanned the page thoroughly trying to figure it out and could not find anything with regard to the shore allowance. Yeah, well, sometimes, you know, it might be in a document that, you know, that was there and it might be in a legal description somewhere in one of the documents that was, okay. that's in and, there. And uh, sometimes it's not in there and we have to look behind that conversion to find it. Okay. And regarding purchasing shore allowances, is that mm -hmm. something that a property owner can do at any time or only the municipality allows it intermittently? Like, how does that work? Yeah, it's not always available, uh, but sometimes it is because it's, you know, certain, you know, eventually around certain lakes and everything or, or, or rivers, the government determines we're there's no need for us to have the shore road allowance that we're never going to do it. We're not going to maintain it. We have no use for it. And we might as well grant everybody's shore road allowance that wants it. And um, so we have to, it's, it's something we have to look into, you know, is it available or is it not available? Certain lakes it's, it's and, and rivers, you're not going to be able to do it. Others, it is available. So, and, 
sorry. Um, so would it be safe to assume then that uh, if you have a shore road allowance that's been purchased by one property owner, which now essentially makes the whole road allowance useless, that another property owner that maybe the previous owner didn't purchase it, that a subsequent one could purchase it at any time? Or you mean an adjacent property owner? Or an, an adjacent property or just anywhere like relatively yeah. near along that same road allowance yeah probably if it, if some of it's been been granted to certain cottage properties that will probably allow it for everybody unless you, you might be the last guy or something and your shore road allowance might be connecting or potentially connecting to a road to okay. a, a public road and they may not want to grant that right okay. because they might need to use that as part of the road improvement or expansion or something like that okay so you have to look into each one's a little bit unique. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So other things that we were looking for in these properties, underground storage tanks. Um, you know, we always want to see, you know, how is the place being heated? Some properties that are adjacent to municipalities might have, you know, like full electricity. There might be gas available from the town. They might have normal connections. Others, it might have propane tanks. Uh, they might be buried underground. Some of them are above ground. We have to look into that. Are they still usable? Have they expired? Are there potential environmental risks? Um, are they owned or are they rental? Uh, rentals. So, and and if they're rentals, can the rent uh, the the lease agreement can that be assumed by the new owner? Are they rent to own? We have to look into those type of issues to figure out what the story is with those tanks. Are there any special licensing required uh, for specific uses of those type of tanks, et cetera? And that's even for, you know, like residential type of use. Now, you know, part of this topic is really dealing with rural properties too. And you get into, you know, I've, I've been sort of focusing on cottage type using, but there's also farm type using in, in a lot of these properties. And we have a lot of these same issues, uh, you know, when a property is really agricultural or a farm type of property, whether it's for, for produce or maybe it's for, for cattle on there. So, you know, we're, we're looking at all these type of issues as well and what uses are permitted on that um, for those type of properties as well. Because even farming properties, it might not have the waterfront issues, not in the water, but we find the same type of access issues for farms. Uh, we have issues, you know, uh, with well water. And even if you're farming, you're farming uh, produce, where's the water coming from? Where is it being drawn from? Is it from pumps or is it being, you know, taken from somebody, an adjoining landowner? Do they have agreements, things like that? So a lot of different issues that come up with that as well. Um, so, I've touched on, on the next point a little bit. Uh, when we're dealing with things like septic tanks and propane tanks and uh, water filtration systems and you know pumping water, whether it's from a lake or a well, uh, sometimes there's service contracts with that to make sure these things are being maintained and looked after properly. So um, is the current owner bound by these contracts for a period of time? Are they assumable by the, by the new buyer? Um, have they been paid for in advance? And we're now, the new buyer is assuming it and there's going to be an adjustment on closing for it. Uh, we have to look at those contracts as well and determine whether or not uh, we're going to be assuming those contracts, whether we want to assume those contracts or maybe the buyer uh, wants the seller to cancel all those contracts, not assume them because they're going to make their own arrangements, either with the same contractor or a different contractor. So, that, you know, those are important issues to look into as well. Now, when we're dealing with certain types of property, there might be, you know, big type of assets or equipment that might or might not go along with it. If it's farmland, are there tractors and farm equipment and certain machinery that are that you want to acquire with it are those being properly maintained are there service contracts for those things do you want them what's the value of those things so those have to be specified in agreement of purchase and sale 
there are often uh, times uh, there's security interests registered against them that you wouldn't find in a registry office search or land title search because it's registered under the Personal Property Security Act. So it's a whole different search that we have to do to see if the vendor owns those assets free and clear. Um, even if they own them, they may have pledged them as security to a bank for loans or something like that. We've got to make sure that any, if there are any PPSA registries against them, that those will be discharged. <coughs> Excuse me. If it is a cottage type property, uh, a couple you know major assets you want to take take a look at is things like boats, uh, you know motor boats, sailboats, things like that. Um, ATVs uh, could be involved. Same type of issues can come up. You know, do they own those outright? Um, are there potentially PPSA registrations against them? Have they been pledged as security to somebody else? Uh, we've we've got to find that out as well. Um, there's a process for transferring an ownership of a boat, for example. Uh, so you can't, you don't just acquire the boat uh, because it's part of a real estate transaction. <clears throat> you have to transfer the boat similar to doing a transfer um, of, a, um, of a motor vehicle. Okay. You know, boats are all have their own uh, license number um, and they're registered with the ministry, or at least they should be. So you want to check that out as well. So your green purchase sale might say you're acquiring, you know, the boats and the et cetera that are, that they currently see there, but we've got to look into it a little deeper and make sure that we get the proper documentation to, to transfer the ownership interest in those type of assets directly to the buyer as well, and make sure there's no encumbrances against them. Uh, certain tax issues have to be addressed as well. Um, you know, HST, just like you, you might be used to doing in a, in a residential urban transaction, uh, is HST included or in addition to the purchase price? If the property itself is, is a used residential property, then it's not subject to HST. But a lot of times these type of uh, properties that we're talking about have a mixed use component to them, especially when we're getting into farm type properties. There might be a farmhouse, which is clearly a residential property on the property, but, uh, but the property is being used for commercial purposes, being used as a farm. So it's really a, a mixed residential and commercial. So we have to determine, is HST applicable and on what? So there might be an exemption for the HST on the residential house that's located on that farm property. So we have to know the value of that property because uh, there won't be HST payable on the residential component, but there will be HST payable on the commercial component. So we'd have to figure out which, you know, you know to determine exactly what uh, part or what percentage of the overall acquisition should be attributed to the residential portion and what's to non-residential. You know, part of it, we're doing that by looking at, at tax certificates to see how they're taxing the property for the residential and non-residential portions. And we can use that to figure out our, our H, what HST should be payable on as well. Um, now, I thought it might be useful just to give you some sample clauses at the back end of this uh, slide presentation. Uh, and this isn't an exhaustive list, and I'm going to give you my, my pre-warning with using any clauses, whether you've got them, you know, Century 21, you have a whole library of, of clauses you have access to. And like any clause you're looking at, you've got to spend time to read it, make sure it fits what you want. So don't just blindly, you know, just next time you do a cottage property, just throwing in all these sample clauses in there without really taking a look with each one and seeing which ones are appropriate. But I just thought it, it might be useful to go through some sample clauses that should be considered on these type of properties that you wouldn't be using at all if you're doing an urban type of residential purchase. So this, this first one is a conditional clause and it's conditional about the, the buyer at their own expense, determining that, that there's vehicular entrances and exits to the property onto public highways and that they've been approved by Public Transportation Highway Improvement Act. So this is basically a clause for a buyer satisfying themselves by making inquiries 
that they can have access, vehicular access to the property. So you might be using this if you're in a situation, your negotiation where you got to satisfy yourself. So you need some time to do that. So you, you know, the rest of the language and here's just standard conditional language that so they've got a certain amount of time to fulfill this condition. And then you got to give uh, notice. And if, and if it's not, then the pause be returned in full without deduction, et cetera. And this is clause for the benefit of the buyer. So there's nothing magical about that. The back part of this language, it's really the first part, you know, that we just want to have a condition in there because you got to satisfy yourself and you, meaning you as the agent with the buyer, or with the assistance of a lawyer, if necessary to, to try and get answers, to figure this out. Other times you won't need this. You might have uh, direct information provided to you by a seller. There might be strong rep and warranty put in there with some evidence to back it up and you, and you know what it is. But if you don't have that, you want to get that this type of clause in there. Okay. Now, in terms of a type of representation and warranty clause that you might want to negotiate in there, uh, this one is saying that it's to the best of the seller's knowledge and belief that the property fronts on, and then there's a few different options here because it might be a road that's maintained on a year-round basis at a public expense, or it might be fronting on a road which is maintained on a seasonal basis at public expense. And sometimes that you'll see like they might be maintaining it in the summer months, but maybe the, the municipality uh, that owns the road is not plowing it in the winter. So we've got to look at that. Um, or it might be a road that's not maintained at public expense at all. So you got to choose the appropriate thing and, um, and get the proper rep and warranty from the seller to give you information as to what it is or what it isn't. And uh, So, so that's just a sample that clause you can use for that, acknowledging that there's a private road to access the property and it, it might be maintained by a cottage association or a group and there's an annual cost you know, for each property. So you'd be using something like this if you've got information about from that association. So this is sort of protection more for the seller because they want the owner to be in the buyer that you know, the buyer is acknowledging they know about this there's a private road. It's maintained by a cottage association. There's a cost that the buyer is going to be involved in. So they're, you know, that's so the buyer cannot at some point come back to the seller saying, "Hey, I didn't know that I got to pay and be part of this cottage association to maintain this road." So if that's your fact situation that there is this association or some group that's maintaining it and everybody's contributing to it, you want to put a clause like like this in there. But you also got to dig down before just using this. We want to, if there is an association, we want to know how the association operates. Um, it, it, you know, was, is it incorporated? Is it uh, a looser association? Is there an association agreement amongst them? Uh, who's in charge? Are there elections? Are there votes? Uh, you know, how, how does it go? How, who determines what the annual cost is going to be? Is there some sort of reserve fund built, built into it for a rainy day uh, or a stormy day and when there's a more substantial cost that might be involved in fixing a road when, if something really happened uh, to it? So you want to find out what documents that actually exist that puts this cottage association or group together. And then we got also look at the, um, the assignment rights. Have they right to assign it? Is it binding on anybody that acquires the property or do they have to sign on and agree that they're now the new owner and they agree to assume the obligations for that property and contribute a certain amount every year. So, okay, don't use anything blindly. We always want to look for the backup information on these things as well. Uh, the, the next clause is a, an acknowledgement again by the buyer that the certain road or path or lane or wherever it's described to the property is an unregistered easement. There's nothing on title. We can search title as much as we want. We're not going to see it because it was never registered on title, but there might be an unregistered easement that all the neighboring cottages are aware of. And, um, 
And every single, oh yeah, you know, there's nothing on title, but I've been living here for 20 years and I've always had the right to go across this and it's owned by my neighbor, Joe, and he's a great guy and he maintains it and we all give him, you know, 20 bucks a month and blah, blah, blah. And you hear these stories all the time and it's an unregistered easement. They've, they've never sat down and put it to writing. They didn't register it on Joe's land who owns it and they didn't register it on the lands of, of this, of the, of all the cottages that have been using this path or laneway or road. And this is whether it's access from a road or it's access to the water, same type of thing. So what we'd like to get at the very least, if we can't get it registered on title, which is always better if we can get things registered on title, but at least we want to get a, a statutory declaration from the seller before closing uh, that will confirm that they've been using that pathway or that laneway that they used it and they have information that the predecessors on title use it and, and for how long they've been using it. So we can establish that this right will, that this right exists over time. Okay. So again, I'm going to repeat myself. It's always better for these types of easements or rights of way to be registered on title. And we, that's what we want them. Like that's the proper way to do it. And we registering on title, it's registered on the title to the, owner of those lands that's granting the right of way, but it should also be registered on title to all the neighboring properties that have the right to go over those lands, the right to use those lands. The, the documents, if the proper easement or right of way is created, it's supposed to be registered on both. You know, one's called the dominant parcel, one's called the servient parcel, but to be proper it should be on both. But sometimes we run across where it's never been put to writing, hasn't been established, but but there is a history of use and this is all that we can get is this declaration and the buyer has got to decide whether they're going to accept that and rely on that or are we going to require our seller to go to to everybody and get these registered rights of way on title to the to the lands as part of this process okay there are certain cottage type properties that have zero accessibility by land, um, the roads, whatever they exist, uh, you know, don't come anywhere near the property. The terrain doesn't permit any further roads to be built. They might be on top of a cliff or it might be rugged land. And there's zero accessibility to some of these properties by land, but there is accessibility by water. And it's the only way you can get to these properties. And even though it's a land property, I'm not talking about island property, because obviously island properties aren't accessible by land, but you know, you, you get to your properties by, uh, by water as well. Uh, so that's an issue that comes up sometimes as well. And we have to look at that and we're looking at, you know, to our searches on the land portion to see how close you can get to it. But sometimes it's, it's just the physical terrain that just makes it impossible to get a roadway or a laneway, you know, over some other lands that will actually lead and give access uh, to a certain property. And you've got to be careful with this too. If you're buying vacant land, you might you might be buying vacant land on a lake that has cottages all over the place, and most people have road access. But when you're buying vacant land, which looks like a beautiful place to build a cottage, but when you start looking into it, you'll see that there's just no way that you can get a connection to whatever the closest road is. To, uh, to make it accessible by land. So even if they want to build this beautiful cottage there, they're not going to be able to access it by land. So that's an important thing. And, and for some buyers, that might be fine. They're happy to access it by water. And for somebody else, it's not, it's not going to be fine. So while I'm talking about this, I should probably just mention islands because we have an abundance of islands in, in Ontario. We have so many beautiful lakes and that have all kinds of islands on them. And... Um, and there's tons of cottages that are on islands. So obviously the only access is to that is going to be by, by water. Some islands are completely privately owned. Someone's buying, you know, the whole island. Some islands are rather large. And, um, and, and some islands even have roads right on the islands as well. And some of those are private roads. Um, a lot of them are private roads and they're maintained by the cottages that are uh, around the the island because they do have some access within the island depending on the size of it so we run into those issues even on island properties as well so even though it's an island sometimes there's 
road access available to a certain degree as well, because the islands are, are big enough that uh, th they have roads on there that's used sometimes just for, for hauling certain materials, because it might be an access point at one end of the island where you're bringing in materials to maintain or build a cottage, and you need the road or access on the road to get to, to another cottage, uh, to your cottage to, to maintain it or for building materials. Other times, a lot of this comes in by barge or other, you know, waterfront uh, type of vehicles that are bringing things for, for the maintenance of these things. But again, it's issues that you have to consider, you know, is, are these properties accessible by water only or are there actually roads on certain islands too? Another clause for us to take a quick look at, this is a representation warranty by a seller uh, dealing with the um, the sewage system. So they're saying during the seller's occupancy uh, of the building, the sewage system has been and will be good working order on closing. So nothing fancy, it's just, you know, rep and warranty that survive, you want it to survive closing, um, but it's going to talk about the state of the property at the time of closing because you want to make sure that you're getting some something from the seller that they haven't had an issue with their sewage system. It's in good working order. And on closing, it's going to be in good working order as well. So just sample clause for that. Here's a, a different type of clause, a rep and warranty from the seller, again, to the best of their knowledge and belief. They're saying that the sewage systems are wholly within all the setback requirements of the property and have all received certificates of installation approval pursuant to the Environmental Protection Act. You know, and that's really important. You can't just put up your own sewage system however you want it. Um, there are uh, bylaws and setback requirements of where you can put a sewage system, underground uh, tanks, et cetera, or it could be above ground in certain circumstances too. But they have to be, you have to meet the setback requirements. So you can't just build your sewage system, you know, right up against your property line, which is right a couple feet away from your neighbor your neighbor's cottage and he gets the benefit of uh, all your nice sewage there. So you have to make sure there's compliance with these setback requirements. You have to get certificates of approval. You have to comply with the Environmental Protection Act. And then you have to maintain these things as well. So we want to get those that confirmation from the ministry. We want to get confirmation that there's been proper certificates uh, issued for the installation of these types of systems. So th that's, those are example clauses that you should be putting in. The third part of this is that the sewage system has the proper use permits under the act and that they've been, been maintained and in good working order during the time the sellers occupied the property and they will continue to be maintained in good working order on closing. And we want the seller to provide any documentation that they have relating to the sewage system that is within their possession or that's been granted to them by any of the appropriate authorities. So, and we want to get that before the, the time that we're allowed to do our search of title. So if we review any of that and it's not proper or not good, we have a chance to write and say, hey, this isn't good enough. We need this fixed up. So it's really important for these type of issues same thing for water potability. You know, water potability and sewage are sort of two of the big ones. We, it's not just enough to get a rep and warranty that everything is good. We want to see the backup. Okay, we want to see the documents it, that have been issued by the um, by the authorities. Okay, that that govern these things. It's not good enough to just take someone's rep and warranty. So this is a sample clause. I, we were talking about about boathouses and docks, et cetera. So you want to have this type of clause in there so you get, um, at least this is a conditional clause. This is a condition, not a rep and warranty, but this is conditional on the buyer determining at their own expense that the boathouse and the dock, the pier, whatever is being described in there that's used with the property. Sometimes there's more than one dock. Sometimes there's, there's a few of them. Sometimes there's docks and boathouses. You're describing whatever you want in there, making sure you complete it properly. But whatever there is that's used with this property and, uh, and is being transferred to the buyer has received all the necessary approvals and permits from the Ministry of Natural Resources, the federal government under the Navigable Waters Protection Act, and 
any other conservation authority that might be applicable or whatever it is, depending on where this property is, is located, but you want it from all relevant authorities. Okay. Not enough to just take a rep or warranty. We want, you gotta, we have to look into this. We have to make sure that proper permits and approvals have been issued by the governmental authorities because they regulate these things. You can't just put up a dock wherever you want. You can't build it to any configuration that you want. Um, the same thing with boat houses. Okay. So we want to make sure these things have been approved. So this is a chance for the buyer to satisfy themselves with respect to those things. Uh, the other way of doing it is getting a, a rep and warranty from the seller saying that these boathouses, docks, piers, et cetera, um, th that are being transferred to the buyer have received all the necessary approvals and permits. And, um, and again, do you want to just take a rep and warranty from them? Or do you want to go further and say, you know, okay, I, I want the backup to all that as well, that the seller is going to produce confirmation of these uh, approvals and permits from the ministry, et cetera. And then you build that into your clause as well, that those things are going to be produced by a certain day for the, for review by the buyer. So, you know, and that's always better, better to have those documents in hand and you get it and those get passed on to you. That's better than just accepting a rep and warranty from, from a seller. So basically that's covering the issues that I wanted to, covered today. I, I hope I haven't dissuaded you from uh, wanting to act for people on buying cottage properties. It's, it's a great lifestyle choice for so many people. There's so many benefits to it. Um, you, you make a client for life if you help them buy a cottage property, that's for sure. And uh, one of the keys is always make sure that in addition to your commission, you get, you get an open invitation to come up and uh, and use these properties as well because it's a lot of fun and i encourage anybody that uh, gets access to, them to to do it if you want to do it yourself it's a great thing to have a uh, great place to bring family and friends to and enjoy it but we want to make sure you're doing it all properly legally and all these issues are addressed you don't want to invite people up there and have them drinking water that's not potable you don't want to run into sewage system issues when you're up there uh, you don't want to have problems with your propane gas tanks or uh, things like that. You don't want to have your your good old buddy Joe who's cottage beside you and your buddies and neighbors and all of a sudden he sells his property and your access to the water or your access to the road was over his property. And now you get a new buyer in there and they say, oh, no, no, we're not giving you that access anymore. It was never registered on title. And now you don't have the same use and enjoyment of your cottage property that you once had. So you don't want to run into those type of issues. And people do all the time on cottage properties and, you know, in these, um, these rural properties. So just be careful. Now you've got a bunch of these issues in your head and you know what you got to tackle. And, um, and then you get some professional help uh, when needed to help guide you through these issues. Okay. So please don't be discouraged. Don't be dissuaded from doing it just do it properly and you're the winner your clients are the winners and everybody gets great use of these properties so any questions that people have there I'll, are I'll questions in the chat, david if you wouldn't mind just having a quick look at them um i have to take another call right now so i'm going to mute myself but there are a few questions in chat if you want to have a look okay so let me see if i can access that Uh, hang on. All right, what do we got in the chat here? Okay. How is tax treated on a hobby farm property? Um, well, that's, I'm not sure which type of tax you're referring to. Um, but there's a few different type of potential tax issues in a hobby farm property because you've got potential HST issues um, to start with. There's potential income tax issues, depending how it's used. So if you, if you have more specific questions, please reach out to me because we have to look at a particular fact situation in order to answer that 
properly. Okay. I don't mean to be evasive, but it's, but that's the best I can do for the, for these purposes right now. Hey, David, it looks like it's HST they're asking. Yeah. So again, HST depends on, on the nature of use of the property. Is there a residential component? Is it a commercial component? Um, so there could be a split there if it's a mixed use where HST may not be applicable on whatever it's determined to be the residential component, but it would be applicable on the commercial uh, component of the property. Okay. Um, how many days would be required to find out about road access? That really depends on the municipality. And well, it depends on two things. One is we have to complete a search of title. And I can tell you sometimes, you know, when we're doing a search of title on an urban property, we can get a search done pretty quickly, generally. Um, most of them don't have issues. A lot of issues have been cleaned up. When we're doing a search of some cottage properties, it can be a complete dog's breakfast for lack of a better term. And it could take hours and hours and hours to sort through things that come up on a search. So one of the things that we're doing when we're searching title is checking out the access. So it really depends on the property. And um, you know, sometimes we can, we can do it in a day or two. And sometimes it takes more time because we have to dig behind and look to see where the documents were that granted these rights. And, um, and we've just had a, a file last week in our office where there were rights of way granted to the water. One of these properties where somebody owned the land and there was about a half a dozen other properties that were granted access to the property over time. And, um, but it turns out it wasn't registered on title to all of the properties. It was at one point in time when we've now discovered back in history, it was registered to everybody, but there's one of these things in a bond conversion to the land title system. It was, it, it, um, the access rights were granted on title to some of the adjoining landowners, but not to all and not to one that we were dealing with. And just, it's basically just a mistake in the registry office that was done, you know, who knows how many years ago, it was over 20 years ago where it just, didn't get translated over into the new documents that should have been. So it took us a while to figure that out. Okay. So sometimes, you know, we look at it, we see, Oh no, there's a, it seems like a problem here. Something's not fit and we're missing something. We've got to go back in the history of the documents to see if in fact it was granted. And then was it stopped on purpose um, because there was something negotiated between prior owners and they, and they stopped granting it. And they, and there's a document that says that, or as it turns out in this case, it was just, it was always supposed to be there, but the government just didn't add it to the description of the title when they converted it into land titles. And now we got to get that cleaned up. So it's hard to know exactly how many days. It really depends on the properties. And sometimes we could do it really quickly. And sometimes it could take days or more. We have to get a conveyance or we have to go to the, you know, get in touch with someone at the registry office. We got to get them to look into it and figure it out. So sometimes we run into these issues that take, a fair bit of time to to clean up okay so, further to joanne's question though um like i mean you deal with this kind of thing a lot what would be a number of days that would be acceptable to you that if you got an offer and that had a, a condition like this on on road access that you'd be okay we should be able to figure it out in this amount of time and you don't want us to say like if we put like two days or three days and you get the offer and you're like come on what's wrong with this agent he's not giving us enough time to do this yeah well it, it's the same thing with with our title search time as well that's built into every agreement like you know we need some time to look into to title and you know but you know if we were given a month to, to look into it, uh, it doesn't mean we would wait a month uh, to do it. It would be possible because we do find a problem or an issue. We want to deal with it right away. Um, but if there's a concern on a particular fact situation that, there, that access might be an issue, then and we have a separate condition about access that's just not part of the general um, title search condition, then, you know, we might need, you know, build it, you know, get in touch with us then say, you know, can you get this done in three days? Can you get this done in a week? And, you know, sometimes we, we think we can do it in three days and we run into problems and we can't give it a definitive answer because we got to get um, a conveyance involved or we got to get, a, you know, the registry office involved. 
And if we're out of time at the end of those three days, then we're not going to be able to waive the condition. And then we're going to try and negotiate an extension of it, which right. would usually be granted because if we're having that issue, whoever the next buyer is going to be is going to have the same issue. Right. So, you know, that's sort of the, the practical answer. Sometimes we get as much time as we can and we try and get it done within that time. And if we run into a problem, then we're going to be looking for an extension of that time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. I think the next question deals with HST on mixed residential and commercial property, multi-residential. Uh, so when, when we're dealing with, with that, we have to have some determination of, uh, on a mixed use property, how much of the property is residential, how much was commercial, like it might be a million dollar purchase price, but is really, you know, it, it might turn out that 25% of the value is really on the residence that happens to be on there and 75% of the value is, is commercial. So, but there has to be some basis for that determination. So if the property has a history, we're looking to see how the tax department dealt with it. Um, how the you know how are they taxing the property? Are they were they taxing? You know, what percentage were they taxing for residential? What percentage are they taxing for commercial? So so that's usually you know, giving some guidance on that. Uh, next question is on propane tanks: Is it required by default for sellers to fill up the tank before closing, or is this to be negotiated? It, it's really a, a negotiated. It's not it's not a default thing. We want to know one way or the other. Um, it usually makes most sense if it's an active propane tank for the seller to fill it up and leave a full tank. Cause then we know the cost of that full tank. So we know how to adjust for it and they're leaving a full tank. And so we give them a credit back. on closing for the cost of filling up the full tank. That's usually way if they know that it's really low, they might be leaving basically an empty tank. So there might be no adjustment for it. And they're saying, you know, we don't think there's much in there, whatever there is to the buyer, you know, you can use it, but it's up to you to go get it filled after closing. Um, so it can be done either way, but it is, the answer is it's really a negotiating point, but better, I think it's cleaner to have the seller agree to leave a full tank and provide evidence that it's a full tank provide a copy of the invoice, and then they'll get a, a credit for that amount um, on closing. Um, what else we got? Uh, back to Joanne, my sellers have always filled them. However, the buyer pays the bill at closing through the lawyer. Yes. Um, I don't see any other questions here. So anybody yeah. has any, I, I've got that, if anybody else has other questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer them. I've got one more, David. Um, I have a situation with a seller that has an island property. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. It looked like it froze. Um, okay. So he's got an island property. Uh, when he purchased the property, there was an existing bunkie. It was a one and a half story bunkie on the property that was situated behind the main structure, behind meaning uh, like further from the waterfront. Yep. <clears throat> so he raised the roof 24 inches to make it a full two-story bunkie that he could get some beds and sleep some people comfortably up there. Um, he did not have any permits when he did that. Uh, he had a falling out with one of his neighbors on the island for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, the neighbor called the municipality. They came in, they inspected the property. Um, they were like, yeah, it's all been done fine. We won't give you any fines, but you're going to have to pay for the permits retroactively, uh, which was fine. <clears throat> uh, he never heard back from the municipality for a long period of time. So then eventually he started chasing them down just by email ended up hearing through uh, the cottage grapevine that the lady who was responsible for these permitting issues had retired, could no longer get in touch with anybody. And he's now considering selling the property, but he doesn't want this issue um, to come up in the sale of the property. So I know they said they were gonna issue him a variance and he'd have to pay for the permits, um, but he never heard back from them. Um, so how would you address this before the sale of the property? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, a couple things there. It's amazing how there's always a cottage grapevine. Um, 
but you know, Sean, these type of issues are, are sort of typical issues that come up because it's amazing in cottage country how many structures there are, like like bunkies and things like that, that are not built with proper permits. Right. And but they're there. And so someone goes by the cottage, oh, this is a great, we've got a main cottage, we got a bunkie, and we, we make great use of it. Like they love it. They want to buy exactly what's there. Yeah. But you know, you got to be careful when you're on the selling side that you're not making any representation or warranty that that these things comply or that we're done with building permits and, and you don't you gotta you i would be hesitant to even put in a listing that, that it has a bunkie yeah and if well, someone questioned the bunkie i think you have to disclose it yeah you know we got a bunkie there you can have it if you want you know i built it myself and i don't have a permit for it um yeah. i can't tell you it's legal the original uh, structure- if you like it and you want to buy it fine if not you want to tear it down you can tear it yeah. That, and that's what I told them. I said, you know, if someone asks about it, we are down, but decline to answer or be honest and it could cause a problem. I told right. him that he should just chase if like, if he doesn't want to have any problems, especially with the market changing now in cottage country, selling the property that he, and it's an Island property. It's not like a mainland property. So it's, you know, not as easy to sell in the first place that mm-hmm. um, he should just chase down the municipality and get the variance and do whatever he has to do to get it taken care of. Is that basically yeah, what you look if it's available, you know, at one point there is someone that would have granted. Now you got somebody else there, they may not grant it to you, right? So yeah, yeah. you never know. I mean, you run into that type of thing. Another, you know, just example that, re- that reminded me of Sean is uh, you know, with boathouses, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, boathouses need permits as well. Now, some boathouses have these really nice living quarters above them, right? In essence, it's their bunky, it's right on, you know. Yeah. above the boathouse and people actually live there and some of them are, are absolutely magnificent yeah in certain on certain lakes and certain parts of certain lakes you're not allowed to build living quarters you're not allowed to build the washroom or have any plumbing uh, on boathouses some you're allowed some it's fully allowed as long as you get permits you're allowed to have living quarters you're allowed to have you know, you, you probably have to have plumbing in order to be allowed to, to live up there. You have to have some sort of, you know, sewage system and, and water system in there. And it's done with permits, et cetera. But there's all kinds of these type properties on the lakes where they may build a boathouse with a permit. They get it approved. They get it inspected. Everything's done. Everything's kosher, so to speak. And then after the inspection, after the approvals, then they build the living quarters above it or put in a wash on comes a buyer that absolutely loves this property loves the boathouse with the living quarters except you got to be very careful for it's the same thing that you know sean are just discussing here like you you have to disclose what's real and sometimes you have to say look you know here's a permit for the boathouse we never got a permit for the living quarters. did that ourselves did that without permits you know take you're buying what you're seeing without any rep or warranty that from us and then they have to make a choice because they, you know, and oftentimes they really want it and they're, they're just going to buy it the way it is and take their chances. But if somebody from, you know, from the town shows up and says, hey, you can't live there anymore and, and, and we're putting a, a work order against it, then, you know, that's going to stop them from using it unless they then apply to get it done. And in some places, um, it's not just a matter of, okay, applying after the fact for the building court for these living quarters. It's not permitted under the bylaws. You cannot do it. So you're never going to get it granted. Okay. So, so there is that risk, but sometimes it's just, you have to show that to the buyer. There is this risk and you have to be prepared to assume that risk because it potentially could get shut down. Right. Okay. So there's all kinds of those situations on lakes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's other questions, but just a reminder, the, the next one in our series is two weeks today. Our topic is going to be residential tenancies on, on that one, how to deal with residential tenancies and properties you're buying when you're, or selling that it's, you know, sub there's a tenant in there. Is the tenant going to be leaving? Is the tenant supposed to be staying? Is it supposed to be assumed? We can't get rid of the tenant. Uh, if there is a tenant, what kind of lease is there supposed to be? Those type of issues is really the topic for, uh, for our next session in two weeks. So please uh, tune in for that one. And uh, any other questions for today? If not, please reach out privately for some of this. You know, send me an email. Give me a phone call. Always uh, happy to, 
to get uh, have these discussions with people. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. David. Just a small question on a uh, buy of uh, multi residential uh, building, a uh, uh, whole building. Is GST applicable or no? Sorry, if they're buying a, a residential building? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the HST is applicable to everything unless there's an exemption. Okay. Used residential property is an exemption for HST. So in a classic resale property, HST is not applicable because it's used residential property. Now, if that property underwent substantial renovations, it crosses the line and then HST would be applicable. Brand new housing, new construction, HST is applicable. Okay, it's generally when you're buying from a builder, it's generally built into the purchase price, but you are paying HST on the purchase of brand new property. HST is applicable on substantially renovated property because it's treated like it's a new property under the Excise Tax Act. So it's just used residential property. If it's minor renovations or you know things like that, it doesn't attract HST. Um, but if you if there's the potential for a property to have undergone a pretty major uh, renovation, then you'd have to look at it because it might be subject to HST, but otherwise it's exempt from HST. So with that, uh, I will bid you all adieu. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.